All right, we're talking with Ned the Dead crew, and we're and we got Ned and Doc Moreau and Kenobi One. <laughs> and give us give us an origin story of the show that you guys had in Green Bay. So what? How did how did you land on that? How did you figure this out? And how did you get started? Uh, 1983. Uh, I was a young man working in a television station in Green Bay. I was a news photographer, and they decided at the time they needed a program to go after Saturday Night Live. They were an NBC affiliate at the time, and they wanted to know if maybe we could start a movie-type show. I was 23 and a wild, sort of wild 23-year-old, and so the show was born at that time, and we tried it, and it became a relative sensation especially since there was no cable <laughs> so therefore it was kind of like you had to watch but uh it caught on within a couple of months and then it was uh rock and heavy at that time so so you guys were like on legit network television uh what what were your backgrounds how did you how did, how did you break into that right away or did you just come in from right off the street and get into it well he was there from the very beginning uh i came along maybe two-thirds of the way in. <laughs> I was working behind the scenes for a while, actually splicing the movies together okay. for him, figuring out where the commercial breaks would go, getting into the movies, falling in love with them, sending him factoids that maybe he would use on the air, and he would do a shout out to Dr. Moreau, the guy working in the dungeon, working on his movies. And uh, then he gave me a tryout. You know, Dude, you know so much about the movies, you should be on the show. Okay. So he gave me he gave me a, a tryout, and there there I was. Okay. How do, how do, why horror movies? How did you guys come up with just horror movies after Saturday Night Live? You know, Saturday Night. Did you think people wanted to watch black and white horror movies and joke about them? Well, it actually came down to the fact that the TV station owned. Uh, you know, in those days they bought big film packages, so it would have you know 30 really good titles and then it would have 50 really horrible titles and a month and, and, and you jumped on the horrible well, ones. yeah but that's what they wanted to run you know and at that time so they didn't want to blow the good movies on a bad time slot so therefore but you know back in the day the way that these film companies worked you had 50 or 60 classic horror movies that were part of a package owned by a station and they could run them five times each so therefore you had this gold mine but they felt like they needed a vehicle rather than to just throw them on Sunday afternoon at three o'clock when the other station had the Packer game and you're wasting the time. Drinking something? Right. You know, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, but that's really what they used to do. In a lot of cases, they'd burn them and they'd just run them when there was, you know, so they thought they'd get the love out of them and they would own these big packages and various... It's like the buffalo, all parts are edible. That, well, that's <laughs> correct. It is like the buffalo. It is. In a time slot to shove them into, right? And I prefer the spleen. If you're talking buffalo, I'm uh, I'm gonna go with the. Spleen. So what 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 is the spleen of the black and white horror movie world? Well, like, what's an example? Well, you know what? I mean, see, I'm a weird uh, weird cat that way because I liked titles like Mars Needs Women. I liked uh, there was a movie called Green Hell that had wasp tissue in it, things like that, wasp tissue, just little stuff sets me off. Now Doc, on the other hand, and uh, Kenobi Wan, they are more, they're more movie buffs, and they have a better handle on the movie thing. You're Bela Lugosi, okay. right? Uh, you're, uh, you're black, black and white movies, yeah. Vincent Price, uh, stuff that's really maybe so bad that it's good, What's your they Vincent say. Price line, Doc? I'm not gonna hurt you. <laughs> it's a great way. It's a great line to use on the last woman on the planet, maybe. Right. Come here. I'm not gonna hurt you. But you have a voice like that. After it's struck out on literally every other woman. <laughs> if you basically, if you mess up on the last woman on the planet, it's you're going without. I think it. You know, just you know, I think it's pretty clear. So you wanna want to make sure that they know that you're okay. So what what was being on TV like when you guys started out? What what did that what did that feel like for you? Well, for me, I mean, I was on again for a long time on, on this show before uh, Doc was involved. I was 23 years old. It was 1983, you know, and uh, I think I was I don't know was I 23? And uh, it was crazy. I mean, you know, because the strange part is we'd get ratings that were like what the news gets now. I mean, we'd get big ratings because again there was 
was nothing else to watch. So it was tremendously nerve wracking and freaky. And like TV in the 80s was still sort of new to people. So being on TV was just remarkable. If you were on TV, it was amazing. So it was, uh, well, Doc has some count here. He's good. It was freaky. <laughs> It was freaky, man. I feel you. <laughs> All right. So, do, if do you guys did you guys feel Kenobi? Did you guys feel like any kind of m mandate or mission to share underappreciated movies with a t the TV watching audience for this? Well, I mean, some movies are just so bad that you know. You, I mean, anybody seen Sharknado? Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, for crying out loud. Um, that was intentional, though. Like they're they're going for that. Like back back in the day, it's it was a bit of like they were trying to make art, you know. Well, I would, I don't know if I'd call it art or not. Um, one program I saw, the director said, "This movie's either going to be really great or total crap. Who can tell?" <laughs> Here's, here's a little difference too, you know, the way the world is now, there's a million vehicles to do whatever you want. You know, there's any form of social media, there's YouTube, there's all of the things, there's places to play whatever it is you do. But if you think back to that time, you know, to make a movie was a serious venture. So it's really cool that people were able to marshal the money and the resources to make movies that ended up being bad. but. The very fact that it was the only outlet, I think, changes changes it. Not to mention that it was film. You had to shoot on film. There were things that you had to do to shoot a movie in those days. Like right now, anyone can get a camcorder or a phone and shoot a movie. So therefore, it dilutes the whole thing. But when you think back then, you know, you had to have something going on in order to even afford or be able to do that. It wasn't easy. I mean, you had to shoot on film and edit on film and do sound on film. So you have to give these people credit. So if the story faltered, oh well, but they still had it together enough to do all those amazing things to make a movie, which now it's so much easier. I mean, editing film is hard, yeah, like cutting it. Literally cut with like cut scissors it. and- Yeah, I cut. when I started in TV news, we would shoot news on film and then we'd come back. Yeah, that's how old I am and we would, Yep, we would have to process it every day and then cut it and put it and look at it and it was crazy. It was unbelievable. All right, so how did you interact with fans in the early days? Because nowadays, I mean, you got Facebook and all your social media and people can be like, hey, they can really connect with you over this weird thing that they love that you also love. But in, when, when you guys were starting out, what was, what was the fan base like? Well, the weird, you know, first of all, you got a lot of mail, which of course now there is no mail, but you would get, you know, on any given week when after uh, Chiller Theater got rolling, so let's say uh, 87, 88 or whatever, you know, you'd get 30, 40 letters all of which were filled with funky junk pictures that they would send or whatever. And then the other thing was, you know, you'd do a lot of appearances in those days. So it was not unusual where you'd go to an appearance and you'd have, you know, a hundred people or a couple hundred people or whatever. So, you know, the neat part was a lot of it was sort of personal. You know what I mean? So you were making more personal contact with people because, as you say, there was no venue for uh, electronic contact. I mean, you either, you know... And then the other thing that was so weird is that just by the virtue of being on television, for people, it was so amazing. Like, you know, if they knew what a doofus I really am, it was, you know, kind of like, you know, and so yeah, I... Yeah, well, but you know what? Here's the thing. I never grew up thinking I would ever be on TV, so I've always had that humility that comes from the fact that this was a gift to me in my life that I've been able to do this. So when people would come up, I just love them. They're so nice. And so, but I think it was a lot more personal in those days. Piggybacking off that, like what is what is it about uh, regional conventions like, like GeekCon here that draws you guys in? Well, my feeling is, is this gives people people want to be with people and that's kind of that's exactly when you were piggybacking you were piggybacking in the right direction because this to me is an exact replica of what happened in the day when people would have to come out to like do stuff for us to interact the reality is is that people want to be with people and the great part about these regional conventions is that 
People get to exercise who they are inside, they get to be who it is they are, and they get to see and be seen and see others like us. And it's the greatest thing in the world. I mean, it gives us a chance to make a personal statement that is not dissed or hammered on and be with all kinds of other people like us. And so I think it is like the crux of what it's like to be human is to be together and that's what i think it's so cool but it really is that's that's a very profound and deep answer well, know, <laughs> so how are you gonna follow that act well <laughs> it also a best the best way to watch bad movies is with somebody that's true. so there's a communal experience uh, his television audience is like sitting on the same couch yeah. we're all sharing in it together and and if they don't like the movie so much because it's a great slog to get through it. Well, we'll lob some some fun at it, okay, and and make it an enjoyable experience. We'll all get through it together, no matter how bad the movie is. We'll get through it together. <laughs> the more ridiculous, the better. You know, I, some movies you can poke fun at and have fun poking fun at it. It just you know it's a good time. As the only one of you guys who isn't in costume here, how, how is GeekCon treating you? Oh, GeekCon is great. Uh, it reminds me a lot of the conventions that I used to go to when we were in college. We're, we're looking at uh, late 80s, and I mean, the people here are just unbelievably friendly. I mean, I haven't heard a crossword from a single person the entire time I've been here. I should give uh, props to Kenobi Wan. He is remastering our classic chiller theater episodes for streaming. That's how you know you've made it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what what's next for Ned the Dead and, and Doc Moreau and Chiller Theater? Yeah, what do you guys get? Right there. They're in charge of the future, right? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's uh, I I've only associated with Doc for what, say three years now? Um, I had heard a uh, interview he had done on the radio and he had made mention that there was a particular time of space where they didn't have copies of any of the programs. And I thought to myself, you know what? I recorded every chiller theater that was on the air since 2007. This guy. So, so you're, a, you're a fan who, yeah, who fan stepped who in. Yeah. Runs it. yeah. <laughs> Did you tie it? It's You're living the dream. That's, that's what <laughs> I thought. He took over. Yeah, I'm not right. talking about a VHS tape at EP. He had digitized them on a hard drive. No, I digitized yep. each program every week. And when I found out the programs he was missing, I edited out all of the booth segments. You know, I didn't didn't feel I needed to send him the movies because everybody's got copies of the movies. Yeah. And uh, packaged them up into an eight disc set, sent them to him. What, what he contacted me, me. What tickles me no end is the fixes and the tweaks that he's also doing. He's improving on things. He's adding sound effects. He's he's making right what once went wrong. In the editing process, <laughs> as he looks over at me, I, I, I am pretty much the poster boy for what went wrong, you know, sadly. Yeah. So I'm I'm having a lot of fun with him, bringing these shows to another level. They were not meant to be one-offs that would air only once and be done. They they have a new life online. How would how would you go about uh, making the presence of you guys in Chiller Theater known? I mean, did, did you uh, plan, like, okay, we watch the movie, here's the cut where we jump in with a joke and you'd, like, write a little sketch or something? I mean, or, or would you just kind of wing it? What? How, how did that go down? Well, here, I'll tell you what, back in the day, I would wing it. It, it, it initially started off where it was scripted by a guy at the TV station, because, again, I was just a young dude and I didn't quite get the whole thing. And then uh, I would be on the teleprompter, but I would leave the teleprompter at all times and then come back. And I developed the skill of reading the prompter, but splitting and then returning. And the people who run prompter, if you've ever run a teleprompter, you're cranking this wheel and the prompter is going, the person's talking, and then they leave it. It's like, oh my God, what do I do? And then they come back. So it was, they were always freaking out, but you know, I kind of learned to do that. And then, then there came a period where the show got really free form because I got lazy and you know, I'd done it for like 10 years and I was sort of like whatever I'm gonna go in and just do this 
Then, when Doc got in the picture, Doc brought the real knowledge of the movies, and then we started, Doc started to write bits that would occur throughout each movie, and we expanded how much we were cutting into every movie, and it really changed it for the better in every way, because now it's something that can live on. I mean, me just kind of talking goofy, that's not a thing that's going to stand the test of time, but the reality is if you're riffing on a classic movie in a classic way, that'll live on forever, and so Doc brought all all of that to the show where he spent the time and wrote stuff and so it still was free form for me because I can't really be completely contained that way and yet Doc gave it a uh, you know a base in reality and so it really changed everything for the better I think it made it uh, made these things you know that they will live on at the time that we shot those cut-ins we had no video playback playback <laughs> and he trusted me to put words in his mouth and just basically describe what was going on in the movie. And he would always just nail it and add a dirty little chuckle and just make it his own. He's a sassy, dirty little man. He's amazing at that. In a legal, friendly way, not a horrible. Jesus. <laughs> no, it's okay. So uh, where, can, where can we find uh, Chiller Theater stuff online? Nedthedead.vidmeup.com or you can just go to their main website, nedthedead.com, and they've got links to it. And the Ned the Dead show on Facebook will always tell you what's coming up, what we're adding to the mix uh, every week. All right. And that'll wrap it up here with the Ned the Dead Chiller Theater, guys. Keep it locked here for more coverage.